for in the, for the rest of the days that God gives me. Someone much smarter than me uh, once said, the money that you earn will establish your standard of living. But what you give away in your life will determine your standard of life. And Keith is just a poster child for all of us to be reminded that we, we gain from what we give. And want to encourage you to be doing the same. And uh, he's a, a great poster child for getting beyond all of those excuses that would be so tempting to keep us just sitting at home doing nothing. So... Keith, thank you. Um, it was in 1977 that a bridge was completed in the city of Baltimore. Uh, it was a very important bridge, very active. Some 34,000 vehicles a day went on that bridge, uh, which comes out to about one every three seconds, 24-7. Uh, the bridge was named after the composer of the Star Spangled Banner, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And everything was fine until it wasn't. On March 26th, very early in the morning, shortly after midnight, the cargo ship, a 985-foot vessel, pushed off from shore. It was called the Dolly, and they were headed to Columbia. Tugboats helped them get into the main channel, and uh, the channel was so easy to navigate that there was no reason for the tugs to stay with them. So the boat started on its journey, and 40 minutes into its journey, the captain received message that all power was out, and they had lost control of the ship. 180 seconds of damage control, and at that point, he was calling out, Mayday, Mayday. Announced it to the bridge. The bridge stopped traffic from both ends. And two minutes later, traveling less than 10 miles an hour, the dolly plowed into the Francis Scott Key, and most all of us have seen pictures of the devastation that took place. A bridge destroyed, and six people who were working on the bridge and did not know of the imminent danger were lost. Everything was fine until it wasn't. As you can imagine, there's an investigation going on because we always want to know the answer to the question, why? And if we can figure out what's going on, then we know where litigation should be and who should blame, uh, who should be paying for all these things because we want to know why. It's just an, a driving question for us. Why did this happen? We just can't even accept that it was just an accident. There has to be a why behind it. And that question is one that haunts us. And that for those of us who live far away from Baltimore, we've had the, our own things plow into our life. And they've left us just devastated. Everything was fine until it wasn't. And if we can find a bad guy in the picture, a villain to blame, it helps a little bit. If the person who dies with elderly and we can say, well, they were old, it helps just a little bit. If we can find that the problem with the crash was a defective part on a car, we can blame that and we know who to sue. And if the problem was a defective driver, then again, we have a point to, to focus our anger and our rage and our frustration. But what do you do when none of that is quite so clear? When the natural disaster hits and the tornado rips through and takes one house, skips over the next, and then hits the next one. And in that randomness, we were the one who got hit. Why? Or out of the blue, we get the call that a loved one, and heaven forbid a child, has taken on this weird thing and their body has just gone crazy and within less than 24 hours, they're gone. And we can't find any reason. They're just gone. Why? And maybe worst of all, when evil is involved and someone is attacked 
A daughter is abducted. A loved one is murdered and discarded like they mean nothing. And we sit back in the rubble and we look around and say, why? It's a hard question. People with deeper faith and higher intellect than me have proclaimed that the question of why is probably the hardest question of all. Why? Even for those of us who have faith, we're opened up to a whole other series of why questions as well. Why? Why, God, did you allow this to happen? You're supposed to be a good God, and if you're a good God and creates good things, why did this happen? And why didn't you stop it? You're an all-powerful God. That's what I proclaim and believe. Why did you not stop this evil? And, and, and if, if you didn't see it at the beginning, why didn't you intervene? I believe that you're a God who answers prayer. And we've been praying, and everybody I know has been praying, and we prayed and prayed and prayed, and we didn't get the result we wanted. Why? the question we're going to look at today and and I'm not going to pretend that I have some easy answers in fact I'm not sure I have any answers at all because why is just a hard question and I know there's some of you who've been through some incredibly difficult things in your past and for whatever reason, you've come to a point where you're at peace and, and, and you found that there is life after death and you found that life in you regardless of what's happened. But there's others of us who we just get stuck. We get mad. And you know and I know people who are just mad at God and due to something that's happened, they've walked away from him. And in part, this sermon is is focused more on those type of people and those kind of hurts that you and I carry. And we're going to look at some biblical examples in just a moment. But but before we do, I just want to to think a little bit more on why, why is such a hard question. Because, Because it is. It's the hardest question. And I think the first reason that I talk about that why why is so hard is that it is both an intellectual question and it is an emotional question. And both are happening at the same time. And intellectually, we need to engage our intellect on it. And there's some concepts that we have to wrestle with. You know, for example, that if God was going to intervene here and stop this evil from happening, then to be a, a righteous God, he would always have to stop evil before it happens. And if he always stopped evil before it happens, then there's no such thing as free will. And there's a whole line of argument that we could talk about. And some of you are saying, yeah, yeah. And some of you are going, but, but wait. But it involves the intellect. And, and when we engage the intellect, some of it is quite philosophical. And I know people who like philosophy and like the circular arguments and how it comes to reason and abstract theory. And I'm just here to tell you, I'm a farm kid from Minnesota and philosophy is not my favorite. I like things that are more linear and you come to a straight and easy answer. And why has no straight and easy answer? So you're going to have to engage your intellect. And over the past couple of weeks, I've, I've engaged some people who've wrestled with this, from a David Hume to a Richard Dawkins, both of which would have nothing to do with God. And I'm just here to tell you, when I spent time with them, I found no hope. And I spent time with C.S. Lewis and others, and my, my current favorite, John Lennox. And when I listened to them and their reasoning and followed along, My heart was at peace, and I found reason to hope. But you have to engage your intellect. But there's no easy answer. And of course, as I mentioned, it's not only your intellect, but it's your emotions, and your emotions are involved. And and they become so strong, and we hardly know what to process. And most of you know that when you're emotionally involved in something, it's hard to be logical. Can I give you an example? It's, just, it's very common in our world. It's when a boy and girl 
perhaps in their teens, have expressed their undying love for each other. And then one of the two decide that their love is not undying, but it's dead. And they break up. And you're left with a teenager in your home who's heartbroken. I dare you to try and talk to them on an intellectual basis. Oh, honey, it's going to be okay. Honey, there's other fish in the sea. Honey, you're better off without them. Now, how many of us have ever said that to a child or to a teenager, and their response has been, oh, I guess you're right. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. No, that, that angst, is, it's so common. In fact, it's so common that a songwriter by the name of Taylor Swift has made a gazillion do- dollars writing songs for that audience. And whether it's talking about the grief or the anger or the resolve or the bargaining, I'm just going to shake it off. <laughs> but our emotions get involved in the process as well. And it might take time for us to find an answer that helps us rest. It's a hard question. Another reason it's a hard question is that we hate unanswered questions. So as soon as we hear the question why, most of us are going to want to step in and say, well, let me tell you why. I I had to get over that. Because, boy, both as a man and as a pastor, throughout my years, when people come to me, I want to be the answer man and give them an answer. And, And I've joked with some people is that I have finally learned at this point in my life the freedom of ignorance. The freedom of what it is just to be able to say, I don't know. I can give you some hints, but I don't know. We hate doing that. We always want to find a reason so that we can all wrap things up and make sense. And we do it with good intent because we're coming to that person who's in pain and our own pain and we want to find reason for it. Let me give you some examples. The first example is one that happened, well, before many of you were born. But for those of you that are close to my age as well, you probably remember this event. It happened in 1982. There was a young Christian man who had just, for the last five years, had impacted his generation. He impacted me. He was a singer-songwriter, and and he sang and talked with just devotion and passion for Jesus that had just compelled us to take steps forward in what our faith looked like. And his name was Keith Green. And in 1982... He went up on a plane with two of his preschool kids leaving his wife, Melody, and she was pregnant and had one in arms behind on the ground. And then within minutes after the plane took off, it crashed and it killed everyone. And my whole generation was left answer asking, why? I can think of a number of people that it would have been fine if you would have taken them out. But why him? So we automatically wanted to try and find a reason for that. And what some came up with is what I've called preventative grace. That God in the richness of his love knew that one day Keith Green was going to do something stupid. So God took him before he could. Which of course is a little bit crazy. Because if that were true, most of us would be dead right now, right? (laughs) But we want to answer the question, why? And do you think for a moment that if any of us went to his widow and said, let me tell you why this happened, do you think she would have been comforted by that? Or do you think she would have hit you in the nose? We hate the question, why? We want to answer it. Another way we answer it is with what I would call karma. Well, you know, there's a reason and it just happened. What time would this accident happen? It was at one o'clock. Well, you know, you shouldn't be out driving at one o'clock at night. One o'clock at daytime? Huh, I wonder what happened. We've done that forever. 
We just want to believe that what comes around goes around. There's a cause and effect and it all makes sense. The disciples of Jesus did that back in John chapter 9 when they came on a blind man. The text goes like this. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because somebody had to have sinned. It's the only reason. It's karma. What goes around comes around. And we end up saying stupid things in the middle of hard situations because we hate just saying, I don't know. Another reason that it's just hard for us to grasp is leaving God in the picture is painful. Because as I mentioned, this silence comes and we just say, God, where were you? It feels like you stood by and did nothing. And it's a hard thing to resolve. But let me tell you, taking God out of the picture is even worse. Because I've read the philosophers who do that. And what you are left with in light of the horrible things that happen in our world is almost a Darwinian response of the strong surviving and the weak being pushed out of the picture. So it bothers you that a bunch of guys got up together and beat up a little kid. Hey, don't let it bother you. Just the strong, they're over the weak. It bothers you that, that men use their strength to hurt women. Just get over it. It's just the strong over the weak. It bothers you that Hitler wiped out some six million Jews. Why does that bother you? It's just a, it's a spoils of war. It's the strong over the weak. Has anyone ever been comforted with that logic? No. It's just a hard question. But let me assure you that taking God out of the picture does not make it easier. I would argue that it makes it worse. So, with that in mind, I'd like to just take you on a, on a road trip through the Bible. We're going to stop by at four different places. I'm not going to stay very long at any of them. But perhaps we can learn some lessons from those who've gone before us on what do you do when you're on the tip of the spear? The first example I'd like to share with you is the example of Joseph. If I had a, a month of Sundays, I could probably get to the bottom of Joseph. But today, in just a few minutes, could I just remind you of a few things? His story is told starting in Genesis chapter 39 and all the way through chapter 50 and beyond. Joseph was number 11 in the line of 12 sons. He was dad's favorite because he was born as the oldest boy to dad's favorite wife. Already, this is messed up. As you can imagine, his 10 older brothers didn't like Joseph very much. So on first opportunity, they took him and they sold him to a troop of slave, slave traders. Do you think he needs years of therapy to get beyond that? I would think so. That's trauma. He gets sold to a guy named Potiphar. Joseph is faithful in all his details. But Potiphar's wife makes a pass at Joseph, and when Joseph doesn't respond and instead says, no, I'm not going to do that, the wife claims that Joseph tried to rape her, gets him thrown in prison. Talk about trauma, reason to be angry and bitter. Boy, Joseph had it. In prison, he was good and faithful, helped lots of people out, and every time he did, he said, hey, please remember me when you get out. You know how many of them remembered him? None. And as the years went by, you would have thought that Joseph would have had this heart that was consumed with bitterness. And I can't wait for the day when I get my chance. And I'm just going to pray I get my chance. Then vengeance is mine, saith Joseph. And instead, with a long story short with his brothers kneeling before him. 
Joseph says this in Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Wow. How did he do that? He allowed his life to be shaped by his character and calling instead of his circumstances. It's a little lesson I learned from my wife. When a difficult thing happened to her and her first response was, I wonder what God is up to in this. And she didn't say that looking for an answer. She said it as a declaration that I refuse to believe that the horrible thing that has come into my life is something that God can't use for his glory and I will keep my eyes on him. I can learn things from Joseph when circumstances aren't working out quite like I think they should. How about Job? Job, there's a whole book in the Bible by his name. I'm just going to read a couple of a few verses at the beginning to describe who Job is. Verse 1. In the land of Uz, there, named a man, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons. He had three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. He had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was the man. And we're already told he didn't do anything wrong. And in the seasons that followed, he lost all his wealth. He lost all his kids. He lost his health. So he was at the point where he was covered with open wounds that he would scrape because it itched so much with a piece of pottery. And in the midst of that, he lost the love and support of his kind and gentle wife who came to him understandably so. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Just tell God where to go. Can we blame her? There's lots of layers to the book of Job that we're not going to have time to go into today. But I'd just like to highlight three different things that Joseph said with very little comment. The next verse, in response to his wife, he said, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. And isn't it amazing how when good things come our way, we're so happy and blessed. And the moment something tough comes our way, where's God? Job 13. Oh, Job 19. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. In other words, I've made a careful assessment of my life and I really don't know what I've done wrong. This is in dialogue with his friends who are trying to tell him it's all his fault. Though he slay me, I will put my trust in him. Then Job 13, that was 13, 19. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, I'll stand with him. I don't know what's going on in my life right now. I don't know why, but I know the end of the story. And at the end of the story, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will put my trust in him. 
couple quick things I'd point out from the book of Job. First is, there are some things in life that we're not going to find out the answer to. Some of them might only take a matter of years. Some of them are going to take about a hundred years. So whatever questions you have, except for the very youngest of you in the room, in a hundred years, you're going to know the answer. I want to know now. And God wants me to wait. The other thing I was going to mention for Job, remember, if you remember the story, he had three friends, and his friends came to him, and they sat in silence to comfort him. And everything was good until they opened their mouths and tried to talk. And I know from my own experience that some of the worst things we can do is trying to give an answer to someone before they're ready to see, receive the answer. To try and explain away why and what and, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. I remember in horror an encounter I had in a hospital when I was quite young. A young pastor who was quite young. Where I tried to speak truth into her life in the midst of her grief. And it was true. It was just too early. So our problem is, is that most of us are unwilling to go and talk to somebody who's grieving or struggling and keep our mouth shut. And how many of us say, well, I would go and visit, but I just didn't, don't know what to say. Then you are the best person to go visit. Go say nothing. I have a friend who's pretty heroic in my mind. His name is Dwight, and there was someone in his church who, as an adult, all of a sudden ended up in the season of depression. Didn't know where it came from, but just boom, it was just there. And for two months, every day of the week, Dwight called his friend. How are you doing today? I'm praying for you. How can I pray for you? Can I share with you just a verse that I was thinking of this morning? That's ministry of presence. Show up. My third place to stop for just a moment is David. David, I, from David, I learned the lesson of cognitive dissonance, that ability to hold two conflicting things in your mind at the same time. It's as a parent when you love your kid 100% and yet you're frustrated with them at the same time. Those two things you have to hold in your brain at the same time. Or it's like a sports fanatic who loves their team and just loves how, what a good season they have. And then you're scared to death that you're going to sit in front of the TV and yell at them because they lose their first playoff game. And I'm so thankful that the Timberwolves are not an object lesson today. <laughs> it's cognitive dissonance. David was able to have cognitive dissonance in his life of being stressed and being trusting all at the same time of grieving and being thankful. And somehow he's able to hold both of those. We don't like that. And we push people towards getting rid of whatever isn't, isn't what we think is right. But David embraced it. We could look at Psalm 3, Psalm 5, Psalm 10, Psalm 13, Psalm 73, which Pastor Greg looked at two weeks ago. Today we're just going to stop for a moment at Psalm 57 and see how David responded with both. Psalm 57, it's a psalm of David when he had fled from Saul into the cave. So in other words, he's on the run. Scary times. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until this disaster is past. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I'm in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. <sighs> Take a breath. 
Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And the psalm goes on and talks about his steadfast love for God and that he should be exalted. And there is a place that we can exist where we have to live with both. I'm I'm stressed and I'm trusting. I'm angry and I'm in love. I'm, I'm hoping and I'm hurting. All at the same time. There are some parts of cognitive dissonance that need to be avoided. This is a form of cognitive dissonance that needs to be embraced as we process through challenging things that come our way. My last example is Jesus. (laughs) We could talk all day about Jesus. But could I just remind you of the two things that I get from Christianity when tough times come? Two things that are important to remember, and I'd encourage you to remember. Two things, they're they're the pillars of our faith. It's the cross, and it's the resurrection. And in the cross, I learn that I have a Jesus who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knows what it's like to be abandoned, betrayed, falsely accused, falsely crucified. He, know what it's, he knows what it's like to feel that darkness of the soul when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I know that in the midst of the darkest times of my life, I have no reason to believe that God has abandoned me because he's been through things and he's here and in the empty tomb I just know the story isn't over I know for the disciples when the tomb they were in the wait they were living in the reality of Jesus being dead all hope was gone But we sang about it earlier. It was all dark. And then light burst forth. And I know that my Redeemer lives. And I will put my trust in him. And I wish I had all the answers now, but I don't. But I know someone who does, and I will put my trust in him. Let me pray for you. And Lord, I I think I have cognitive dissonance right now because I'm so thankful for who you are and I'm so thankful for the way you revealed yourself to be faithful to so many people who I know in this very congregation who suffered deep loss and they have found hope and grace and strength in you and and thank you and at the same point Lord I just feel for those who I know are still struggling they're mad, they're hurt, they're empty and I pray that in the midst of their pain that you would reveal yourself to them as a God who's good is a God who is able and that in their own life that there is life after death and that whatever has died or is in the process of dying for them right now, help them to know that there is life after death. And while we wait, we'll keep our eyes on you. Amen.